You're listening to Shadow Locked. Don't stop listening. I know your IP address. I'm Martin Anderson. I'm the founding editor of Shadow Locked, and welcome to the first of the Shadow Locked podcasts. This time, a Shadow Locked contributor, Aaron Nyer, and myself are having a chat about the Star Wars prequels. Do you know, as somebody who's worked a lot in an office, the prequels are full of meetings, and there is nothing more deadly, <laughs> nothing more deadly than a meeting. I mean, it's, it couldn't yeah. have been worse unless they got one of those um, slideshows out, you know, to indicate, you know, how well the Empire's doing. Whereas mm-hmm. the first three films, everything's kind of in chaos anyway. You get uh, Cushing having a quick meeting with the round table guys, uh, Richard mm-hmm. Le Palmentier, and we see Vader do his um, thing. But, you know, it's not full mm-hmm. of meetings. The first film is chock full of meetings, both on the bad and the good side. Films about meetings, I mean, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, you know, well, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, you know, that's a very different kettle of fish. A little side note, Glen Gary, Glen, Glen, Gary, Glen Ross. That movie makes me so uncomfortable. Tell uh, me about it. That was my last job. Yeah. Oh, in, fa- in fact, the training video for my last job for a trainee, they showed them the clip from um, where Alec Baldwin is giving... Oh, the- you're kidding me. No, no, no. They said, that's, that's your training video. I think they were joking, but kind of, you know, half joking. I hope they were. <laughs> Are you looking forward to, to this cycle of 3D releases? Good lord, no. I because the prequels are so visually flat, I can't imagine uh, that watching them in 3D would would give me any kick at all. Uh, on top of them just being crappy movies, and I don't want to pay a premium to see crap. Not even to see Yoda looking good in uh, the first one. I saw that. I saw that back in 2005 when mm. they when they created that footage. They put it on the... Um, if you bought the score for Episode 3, and I was buying a, a lot of scores mm-hmm. uh, at that time, if you buy the score for Episode 3, it comes with a DVD called uh, uh, Star Wars A Musical Journey. Mm. And it's basically an hour-long music video of various uh, pieces of score from, from the six movies. And it's really great. And in it is the footage of CG Yoda from Episode 1. So I saw it a long time ago, and I went, oh, great. Someday they're going to replace uh, awful, awful Episode 1 Puppet Yoda with, uh, with a CG one. And I was, I'm totally behind that. But no, I, I, I'm not going to what is a three? What did I pay to see Hugo? Uh, for people out there, I live in New York City. Mm-hmm. And I go into Manhattan to watch movies. Yeah. Because there's no there's no good theaters in my neighborhood, and so I think I paid like seventeen fifty eighteen bucks, yeah, maybe you know, upwards of twenty dollars uh, to go see Hugo in three D, and I was just like, what the hell am I doing, I'm paying extra money for this? No, there's I just absolutely no interest in seeing uh, the prequels. Uh, originally, when when they first said, oh, we're gonna put all the Star Wars movies out in three D, I thought, okay, I'm gonna go see Empire just because yeah. it's Empire, but. Uh, recently, I've kind of turned around and said, you know what, I I'm gonna go see A New Hope, if if only for that opening shot of the Tantive Four, and then the you know the Star Destroyer coming over top of us. I think that will be fantastic in 3D. You think uh, that will be the original sh- original shot, do you? Well, I don't think it will be. There's very little they can tweak that. In in all of the versions of Star Wars, they've never played around with that shot so i, I, mean, I can't imagine that they will now that's a sacred shot and it's i um it, it seems incredibly difficult to turn that in, in, in into 3d with, without uh, making a model of it and having two virtual camera lenses but uh you yeah. know fingers crossed we'll see well whatever they do with it i'll i'll be fine the 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 the, the trench run at the end mm. i mean it oh, yeah. kind of looks like it was made to be in 3d oh scenario. yeah Okay, that's going to be cool too, and in between these two scenes, there's a movie that I like, so I'll be okay. God knows what 3D tickets are going to cost in 2016, um, but I'll probably see A New Hope, and I'll definitely see Empire. Uh, yeah, I watch Empire uh, for Christmas, uh, and not because it has anything to do with Christmas, just because hey, there's snow. Yeah, it's uh, snow. Yeah, it's got the atmosphere, and it's got that wonderful seventies feel to it that uh, mm-hmm. I think Irving Kirshner brought over. You know, it's got this kind of darkness to it, which is certainly absent in the rest of the Star Wars universe, with the possible exception of Revenge of the Sith, but badly handled uh, oh, yeah. compared to yeah. Irving Kirshner. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is this is 
the only re-release so far uh, for Phantom Menace. I was listening to um, to the Force Cast uh, mm-hmm. that the guys from from the Force dot net I think mm. yeah. uh, that they do, and they mentioned that uh, some that I hadn't thought of, which was it's been 13 years since the Phantom Menace came out or, or thereabouts, and how that's almost this stretch of time between Return of the Jedi and the Phantom Menace. Yeah. Um, and then I was just about to jot down some notes when they said exactly what I was thinking, which was that well, in the in the space between Return of the Jedi and Phantom Menace we had nothing to look forward to between 1983 and whenever it was that, that the Timothy Zahn trilogy came out, uh, might've been 92, 93. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was really just this great void in star Wars. The only thing to fill it up was the West end D six star Wars role-playing game. And that's really where the expanded universe came from. Uh, when, when Zahn and, and those first few authors were trying to jump back into writing star Wars novels, this is where the information came from was from this huge trove of, uh, of, of source books for the West end role-playing game. Uh, which I played the living shit out of Whoa. when I was in in uh, like eighth, eighth, ninth, and tenth grade. It has uh, uh, since been long discontinued, but the books are still a great source of information. And that's really all there was for a long time. And then it was about ninety four, I think, when uh, Lucas said, "Oh, I'm I'm going to make more Star Wars movies," and the, there was much rejoicing. But little did we know that they were going to be progressively worse. What was your reaction to The Phantom Menace when you first saw it? I, I didn't really know how to react. You know, I saw it at a midnight show, and I remember you know, getting getting the goosebumps when the Fox fanfare started a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, mm. and the big blast of horns as Star Wars comes up on the screen and the crawl starts, and I'm like, holy shit, mm. I'm watching a new Star Wars movie. This is awesome. I haven't seen a, a new Star Wars movie since I was three years old fantastic fantastic and as it as it went on i just realized how bland it was and how unexciting it was and how i'd really been gypped when it came to darth maul Mm. you know um, so much marketing was based around him and and he's he's barely in it at all Uh, a lot of the things that i thought were going to be plot points just weren't there and i thought okay well screw it that it, it's whatever it's not like i'm not going to see it a whole bunch more times maybe i'll there you know it's like the other star wars movies and the more you yeah. watch the more you like them mm. and i saw the phantom menace four times in the theater mm, yeah and it was just as as boring every time so i i too saw the phantom menace three times and it, it took that long to realize that it's not a great film but then again the weight of expectation was just mm-hmm. phenomenal um yeah and I don't know uh, if if anything could have lived up to it. At that level, no. Obviously, nothing could have lived up to the expectations that we had. But in the in the later, it, as the years wore on, and, and you watch that movie more because you know when episode two is getting ready to come out, I went back and I watched Phantom Menace a couple of times just to just, you know make sure I'm not going to miss anything. Yeah. And and the movie never got any better. And then you start to realize what's wrong with it as you as you continue on and and the question becomes less could anything have lived up to our expectations and more why wasn't this a better movie i've got a theory about it and the theory is this that i think george lucas wanted actually to show that not necessarily the complete arc of anakin from kid to darth vader but the complete arc of the emperor it seems more realistic to me because that's what the story was. <laughs> yeah, and he was very scarcely featured in The Phantom Menace compared to the following two films and particularly Revenge of the Sith. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this this transformation from this absolutely kindly um, figure to this mm-hmm. ultimate evil. And I feel that to accomplish that, they aim to have a film about um, tax laws. <laughs> so, you know, oh, we, we, we had to show him as a bureaucrat and uh and somebody fiddling about with papers um you know, and i was yeah. fine with that yeah. really the the whole the whole thing with with palpatine showing him as you know, a senator and then he becomes chancellor mm-hmm. and then in episode two you know his skin gets more sallow and and uh-huh. uh it, it's it becomes obviously yeah every star wars fans <laughs> all go watch episode one and go oh look it's it's the emperor and he's young or mm. and 
it's re- I'm sorry. A side note: It's really funny. I just I just was um, flipping through a, a high definition copy of Return of the Jedi the uh-huh. other day, marveling at how great the Emperor's makeup was. Really good. His skin looks like like paper, and <laughs> and and he really looks like an old man as opposed to Episode Three, once the face comes out and he's just this rubber penis monster. Yeah, they screwed it, the head up on that. I, I could you know, not. I should never that. have never have taken the cow down. You know, it, it it just didn't work. But you know the annoying thing about Return of the Jedi when he's talking to Luke and it, it's a fixed shot. There's this kind of glitch. And they mm-hmm. they haven't fixed it in any version. They've added cities, CGI cities, and spent millions of dollars of I- island it's, and you're talking, about, you're talking about the the black splotch the black inside splot. of his hood. Why have they not fixed that in all the versions? I don't know if it's going to be in the 3D version. They finally fix it, you know. But my God, it, I, um, I, it'll probably be there because Lucas said this years ago when when he was going back to do the the original um, special editions. And it's ludicrous that I have to qualify special edition with original special edition. Mm. But <laughs> um, he, he said, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to fix mistakes. I'm not doing this to fix technical mistakes. And technical mistakes were there because that's what happened when we made the movie. Mm. I, you know, and, and then he just opened his mouth and bullshit flew out. That was probably the only honest thing that he said uh, yeah. ever. <laughs> uh, have you ever read uh, The Secret History of Star Wars? Uh, not that one, no. The Secret History of Star Wars was was a free book for a long time uh, that that the guy who wrote it was offering on his website, and I downloaded the, probably one of the last um, drafts of of the free version, and now now it's in stores and and you got to pay for it. Sure, but the free version is still floating around out there, and it's fantastic. It's about six hundred and fifty pages, and <laughs> it gets into every single thing that went. That, that that was involved in the sort of coalescing of of George Lucas's Lucasness, mm-hmm. um, and and going into making it going into making Star Wars, the making of Star Wars, and then the fallout from Star Wars being a massive hit. Can you give and, us an example of this? Well, of illustration. One of my one of my favorite things uh, in the book, and there's lots of really great things, is um, all right. So Star Wars happened. Mm. And it was this massive success that nobody was expecting, le- least of all him. He just wanted to make this remake of The Hidden Fortress by Kurosawa. Yeah. And and, and with his World War II elements. And there it was. And it was great. And everybody loved it. Not everybody. I mean, there were, there were bad reviews. But it was making money hand over fist. And he now, when everything settled down and Fox was like, hey, we, will you make another one? He's like, yes, but you've mm-hmm. got to let me do everything that I want, however I want. Mm-hmm. Do not impede me in any way. And they were like, please, please do. You made the highest grossing movie ever. Mm. Just do whatever you want. And he's like, cool. But he had this idea, which was, I'm going to build me a big f- film studio out in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Uh, an hour from San Francisco. Yeah. And this is going to be where people come to make their movies. And it'll be a real, you know, it, it was a real seventies kind of idea of, of like, you know, we're going to make our movies away from the man. Yeah. And they're not going to be able to tell us what to do and blah, 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 blah. But the problem is he built it so far away from Los Angeles and nobody wanted to go. The point though, is that while he was building this place, empire went into production. And he got his old film professor, Irvin Kirshner, to mm. direct it because he's like, I can't direct it. I have to oversee the building of the ranch and, mm. and, and Skywalker Sound and the studio and all this, that, and the other thing. And he sunk, uh, we'll say $300 million bucks. I'm, I'm pulling that number out of my ass, but it sounds right. That's including it, the merchandising, which famously... Oh, obviously, yeah, yeah. 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 Fa- fa- very yeah. famously uh, yeah. rakes us over, uh, over and over and over and over and over again for yeah. years. Um. So it will say 300 million bucks, right? Yeah. Well, he takes about half of that to build the ranch. In simultaneously, a, a portion of his money is wrapped up in Norway making Empire. Simultaneously, his wife leaves him. Yeah. She was the editor on Star Wars who managed to take this wreck of a movie and put it together into some kind of. In, well, she put it together into what we wound up seeing, and so. That Star Wars money was hers as much mm. as it was his. Yeah. 
because you know everybody who was involved said without her this movie just would have been a complete mess so she left and she got the rest of his money she got the other 150 million bucks mm. so now george lucas is sitting there broke as a joke all his money is tied up in making this ranch and in making this movie and kirshner and gary kurtz the producer are sending him back footage that is driving him absolutely apeshit because it's not what he wanted and yeah there's there's the the common perception of empire as the best star wars movie i think it was the most i think it it was the the best you know narratively and acting wise because you had a director who knew how to deal with people lucas has admitted up and down left and right in numerous uh, interviews that he does not know how to deal with people he actors well, I think that the prequels have showed us that he also doesn't know how to deal with a director of photography. Oh, yeah? Because those movies look like ass. That's controversial. Can you give, give me an example? All right. They're flat. They, the, the, the frames are extremely flat. The beginning of episode one, what do you got the first time you see the Jedi? They're oh. walking in a flat shot, in, almost in profile, down this hallway, and then they go through a door... And they sit in a room that's shot completely uninterestingly, and they're brought to uh, the live action elements mm. in in episodes two and three. And I separate that though I separate two and three from one because more of one was shot on location, yeah, than than the other two. And so the live action elements of of two and three which are superimposed over the, these, these beautiful <laughs> CG vistas and, and like the gigantic interior of the Jedi Temple. Mm. The, the, if, if you just look at the plates, yeah. it's wonderful. And then you, you add the live-action elements over top of it, and it looks like balls because <laughs> Lucas is just shooting people walking. Yeah, They walk. And then they stand, and then we go into a shot reverse shot, and then they walk, and then they stand, and then we go into a shot reverse shot. They are the most boring movies from a cinematic cinematographic standpoint. How can we marry this up against uh, getting good performances in uh, uh, from Donald Pleasance and in American Graffiti? I mean, Donald Pleasance wasn't was he uh, was in American Graffiti? No, no, no. Donald Pleasance in THX 1138. Okay. Why suddenly did Lucas... I mean, was he so distracted by the uh, by the ambience that he simply hired actors? I mean, what Ridley Scott does, he always says that once you've cast right, 90% of your work is done for you. It oh, looks don't in... even get me started on the casting. <laughs> but yeah, but if that's a true principle, then he cast wrong because he needed actors who needed a lot of input for the sequels, and they weren't going to get it. And it was pretty famously obvious that they weren't going to get it from Lucas. Right. Well, now now that you've brought it up, um, and thank you because I, this is a tirade I love to go on, <laughs> um, and now I get to spread it over the world. Uh, the casting for Episode One bothers the living hell out of me mm-hmm. because I feel it is extraordinarily calculated to make this look like some kind of indie picture. Because what do you got? You've got Liam Neeson, mm-hmm. who's not a huge star yet, but he was he was well known for being a dramatic actor. Mm. Uh, Rob Roy, Schindler's List, Excalibur, yeah, right. Not Excalibur. Well, I'm older than you. <laughs> he's an, no, I love Excalibur. It's just he's in that movie for about three seconds. He was too busy uh, banging Helen Mirren uh, behind the sets. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. But he's in it for more than three seconds. But we'll agree. Well, to yeah, that. a little. A little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, you've got, you've got Liam Neeson, who's kind of supposed to be the the, the veteran actor, the one who's going to carry it. He's the uh, the Alec Guinness. Mm. And you've got what you've got the little girl from from the professional. Mm-hmm. You've got you've got a. Uh, uh, Renton from Train Spotting, and you've got Jules Winfield from Pulp Fiction. Holy shit! There's a, a numerous magazine covers, but the one that I remember is the one from Entertainment Weekly, which had the four of them on it, and the headline was "The New Star Wars." Mm-hmm. And I'm looking at it, going, "Oh wow, awesome!" Because you know I'm 16 years old. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 
actually no, I guess I was 18. But uh, but the point is, uh, years later, I'm I'm watching Phantom Menace in Spanish and going, um, wow, I I can't believe that they got this cast with the forethought of we have to get a whole bunch of people who are cool right now to obfuscate the fact that this dialogue is atrocious. There's and, no arguing there. And this movie makes absolutely no sense. So if everybody just goes, yay, it's the little girl from The Professional. Yay, it's Jules Winfield doing nothing. Yay, it's it's Renton <laughs> doing nothing. Uh, yay, it's Rob Roy doing nothing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I can I sidetrack and say that uh, I don't think Ewan McGregor has done a decent performance since Train Spotting, and I loved him in Train Spotting. <laughs> and yeah, I've waited film after film after film after film, and he's the coaster. Um, I'm afraid. <laughs> I I I most respectfully disagree. I I like Ewan McGregor. Um, I want I to like him. I want so much to like him. But I think a good two thirds of the time he's just kind of a placeholder mm-hmm. uh, for for a better, taller actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he he will occasionally turn in performances uh, either in movies that I really like, or his performance will be <clears throat> just above good enough. There are so many people worth hating that when somebody comes along who who is good enough i'm i'm like oh god i have nothing bad to say about you thank you he had two movies that came out recently beginners with with christopher Plummer and perfect sense i saw okay. perfect sense uh, with ava green which really interesting mm-hmm. um a very interesting movie about the the end of the world and he was fine i think when he when he's allowed to just use his real voice he's a lot more tolerable there are people who do one for the money and one for the show. Now, M- Michael Caine has always been one of those. Uh, he'll do something... Reading Michael fant- Caine's uh, biography right now. Is, yeah, funny. yeah, <laughs> ab- absolutely. So he'll do Jaws 4, and then he'll do, I don't know, it, Hannah and her George, sisters. Jaws 4 is a terrible movie, but it paid for my house. <laughs> And it's a horrible Michael Caine, but... <laughs> you know, but whereas Ewan McGregor seems to phone it in every single time, I don't know if he's actually got the depth, and yet he seemed to have it in, in train spotting. I no, remember thanks. being impressed by him doing his... The one time in The Phantom Menace that he, he impersonates Alec Guinness is in the trailer, and I thought, well, wow, he's going to be doing Guinness in this film, and he doesn't. He does it in that right. one line. Um, rather disappointingly, like the end of the Star Trek movie, where um, it takes that long for what's his name, the new Kirk, Chris Chris Pine. Chris Pine, yeah, yeah. Finally, at the end, he does a, sh- a Shatner pulls, and we have to wait that long to get yeah. it. You know, uh... I. It's funny. It's funny that you bring up the most recent Star Trek movie. When I saw that, I left the theater. And I turned to my friend and I said, you notice how good you feel right now? He's like, yeah. Mm. I said, imagine if you felt this good at 2 in the morning, May 25th, 1999. And he's like, I I don't get you. I'm like, the minute after you finish watching The Phantom Menace. (laughs) I said, this was the best Star Wars movie since Return of the Jedi. And he's just like, oh my god, you're so right. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's horrible. (laughs) I hate being right. You know what I was saying earlier mm. was that um, now, for instance, the Star Wars prequels, if you look at Yoda in the original release, he's a puppet in the first one mostly. A, a shitty puppet. And a really rotten puppet and really anorexic. And then the second one, they get him better. <laughs> and the third one, they get him right. And now, right. of course, they've, put, they've backtracked and they've put the right one mm-hmm. back in Phantom Menace 3D, right. which is right. great. But it leads me to something I was reading about Close Encounters. You really can't actually see any definitive version of Close Encounters anymore because it had the original release. And then I think at the time of the original release, there was actually a cut that removed the Roy Neary divorce thing. And then in the 81 re-release, which had uh, the Cotopaxi and everything else, the divorce thing was totally out. And that really changed the tone, you know, the kind of grimness of the film. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there have been the special editions since with added CGI and various edits, the tweaking, the tweaking. And what I was saying was that uh, Close Encounters, you now need a roadmap to understand what was original and to understand where the film is. It's more like Meccano, the bucket of components to make mm-hmm. a new version out of it for a, a triple, quadruple dip. And so now here we have Star Wars coming out again. 3D has fueled the entire thing. And we're going to see six different movies. 
Uh, and I guess as an old guy, or as an older guy, it bothers me that there's no more definitive movie. I mean, there's only one Casablanca. I'm not aware that there's a, a second version of Casablanca where, you know, Rick goes around the back and and has a fag and talks to a, a, a cigarette, pardon me, and talks to uh, some janitor. <laughs> Sorry, dude, you're British. You can say fag. Yeah, <laughs> well, you guys know. Um, you know, Casablanca's definitive, and these films are no longer definitive. They're kit yeah. form. I, I mean, I, how, how, how do you feel about that? Does it bother you? Okay. The movies that, that do wind up getting tinkered with repeatedly are few and far between. You've, you've mm. got Star Wars movies, you've got Blade Runner, and you've got Close Encounters. Uh, I can't think of, of any other movies that have been really just rejiggered repeatedly. We'll get on uh, to Blade Runner shortly, because I think it's a different right. pace, but yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, you know, E.T. got its, you know, got tweaked a little bit, which recently Spielberg was like, that was a mistake, I'm sorry. <laughs> I believe in the next, whenever the next re-release of E.T. comes, he's going to put the guns back in. Oh, yes, that's right. They uh, CGI'd um, radios, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, he was just like, that was dumb, and I'm and mm-hmm. sorry. Because these are really the only movies that they could you know, putzed around with so often, uh, one, I'm used to it with Star Wars at this point. I, I have a digital copy of the 1977 version. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, no, it's the 1978 version, the one that says Episode 4. Right, of course. Yeah, um, before, which is discontinued now, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. cannot Cannot get, buy it except on eBay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you just can't get that. You can't. You'll never get it on Blu-ray. It only came in that uh, non-anamorphic version on mm-hmm. on some trickled out. It was an extra on, yeah. on the last trickled out DVD version. I I'm a big champion of Star Wars Revisited, which is a fan edit. Um, there's been a, a couple of drafts of it, but uh, the 2009 version is the one that I have. And this guy, I only know his pseudonym, uh, Adawan. He went in and added special effect shots, mm-hmm. took out other special effect shots. Uh, but the stuff that he did was really subtle. Like he he made the the masks in the in the cantina scene. He made everybody blink. Um, you know, so Greedo blinks and has facial expressions now. Yeah, that is a CGI equivalent of putting a flock of birds into the background of a big vista. I'm afraid. <laughs> right. You know? it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, but it's, it's the thing is, it's, it's just there. Yeah. It's not like it's not like oh, the okay when 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 the the '97 version of of A New Hope, uh, the approach into Mos Eisley. Mm. All of those new shots mm. that just looked horrible and oh. added nothing. And I, 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 I could not I could not stand that. And Well do you know like, what I liked about Mos Eisley originally? It looked like a tiny little western shanty town. Yeah. And that seemed right right yeah. to me. And then suddenly it's a kind of sprawling city which kind of didn't make sense to me. It looked like a kind of a Clint Eastwood um shanty town shack area which yeah. which which was good. Um, I've always imagined Star Wars as as kind of a western. Mm. Uh even after it gets off of, obviously, especially while it's on Tatooine, but once it gets off of Tatooine, it becomes more of a sort of World War II escape movie. But up until that point, I, 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 oh, I definitely think it's Western. I totally agree with you on the on the whole, you know, Eastwood Shantytown thing. There were some good things fixed. Uh, we needed a shot of the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars actually leaving Mos Eisley, and we got that in the yeah. 1997 re-release. That yeah. was definitely missing. Um, what we also got, unfortunately, was uh, the, the, the two equ- almost equally appalling versions of Jabba walking right. over Han Solo, which is just right. like something... No, I- it, was, it was the other way around. It was Han stepping on Jabba's tail. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're quite yeah. right. Um, and I could have done that in in After Effects, and I'm not an expert. That was that was rubbish on both occasions. But that's just the determination to include the famous scene because people have been talking about it and seeing still since uh, the craze began in '77. Mm-hmm. So of course there's pressure to put the scene in, but it needed millions thrown at it, and I think it got about <coughs> thirty grand. Yeah, and it's it... poor. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's. If Lucas wanted to go back and do every single thing that he ever said he was going to do, then we would have 12 Star Wars movies. Because you know, in, in the original rush of, of interviews after Star Wars broke, there was an interview in Rolling Stone where he said flat out, I'm gonna make, I'm, there's going to be 12 of these. He goes, mm-hmm. he goes mm-hmm. um, 
you know, if this movie continues to play in about a year, uh, I'm going to add a, 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 like a number to to the picture, and it's going to be episode four. Mm-hmm. And so there'll be three to take place before this, and six to take place after, or you know, eight to take place after this. And he said that to a few different people. And then around the time that he was doing the interviews for Empire, that changed to nine. And he denied ever having said 12. And to this day, he denies ever having said 12. But it's like, asshole, we've got you in print repeatedly saying yeah. that there's going to be 12. And then when Return was coming around, Star Wars had screwed his life up so bad that he was just like, forget it. After Return, I'm, I'm not doing it anymore. Because I was supposed to do nine, but you know, screw it. You, you people can deal with three. For those of us less knowledgeable than you about Star Wars, can you explain why? I mean, you, uh, you've explained why Irving Kirshner did Empire for practical reasons. Uh, why did Lucas choose Markand again when presumably he had some semblance of his life back in order and could have actually directed it himself? Uh, Marquand was George Lucas's hand puppet. That movie was directed by George Lucas, mm. much like Toby Hooper on Poltergeist. Spielberg directed that movie. Yeah, but... and you can tell, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can so tell. <laughs> uh, Marquand was just kind of there saying action, but it was Lucas who was doing the sort of the important aspects of directing, you know, over overseeing special effects and overseeing the screenplay, which was still being written by real humans and not the Lucas Bob. Lucas is very complimentary about Markwin on the commentary of Return of the Jedi. I guess that's why. <laughs> yeah, Markwin did exactly what he wanted him to do, as opposed to Kirshner and Kurtz. You notice he fired Gary Kurtz after mm. Empire, even though Empire was a massive, massive success. Mm. And it's because Kurtz was like, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid. And I, I want to make good movies. I, I, you know, I want to keep making movies that get nominated for Oscars. And Lucas wanted to just sort of excrete a, a two-hour fluff that that meant nothing to nobody. And that's that's unfortunate because obviously here we are, all of these years later, still talking about it. We're still talking about the history of it. We're still talking about the circumstances under which it was made and the fallout of it. And you know, there's there's still more Star Wars coming. Theoretically, we've got a TV show, a live-action TV show coming, mm-hmm. which I don't think is ever actually going to happen. Going back to the prequels, which are mm-hmm. heading for prominence again, I've right. got to say that I liked Revenge of the Sith, and I felt that Lucas had listened rather grudgingly to the fans, certainly in downplaying Jar Jar, who was going to be the new 3PO, which we, we, you know, in, in Clone why, Wars... Why would in... we need a new 3PO if we had... Well, I know, I know. We had 3PO, and it was perfect, <laughs> and, you know, so nuts. But in Revenge of the Sith, there was there was a genuine darkness, and it came from Lucas. I don't know if it came from Lucas, but he let it in. And I was rather impressed with that, I've got to say. I know there are haters, but I wonder if they're hating the trilogy rather than the film itself, because despite a great many flaws, we get Hayden Christensen doing slightly less wooden acting. We get... Um, Man- Man- Mannequin Skywalker. Yeah, Mannequin Skywalker. Uh, slightly improving it. The romance is as bad as ever, but at least it's short, much shorter than clone, the Clone Wars. You know, there's you, mean, some... you mean Attack of the Clones? Attack of the Clones is what I right. mean. Yeah, pardon yeah. me. It's all right. Make allowances for my ad- advanced years. Yeah, much less romance, thank God, in um, Revenge of the Sith. And uh... But what was there was so much worse than oh, the yeah? stuff in Episode 2. Tell me. Well, okay. the The scene on the balcony where where Natalie Portman kind of looks like a emaciated skeleton. The the whole um, I'm so in love with you. No, it's because I'm so in love with you, oh, and no. I wanted to jump Ooh, in yes. front of a bus. I wanted to jump off that ledge. It was it was bad. I, I'm watching it. And I'm going. Are you serious? Is this the movie? Am I watching the movie? Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. it better be because I was already like 45 minutes in. But little did I know damn thing was two and a half hours long and i'm just going please please let this go away and it did it it was mercifully short and there's so much less of it than in in episode two but it's just that much worse he does share james cameron's inability to write a credible love story and it's it's funny because you know these people have had uh, marriages and divorces you think there'd be some information there to inform mm-hmm. the writing of a love scene and yet these particular two directors have this kind of weakness in in, in well, writing love scenes cameron's been married like what four or five times now <laughs> i think cameron's writing his the love scene he'd like to take place kind of escaping the reality of his, of his marriages i yeah. don't know if that's the case with 
with Lucas, but he certainly uh, cannot cannot write love scenes at all. I think that um, A New Hope got by uh, solely because of the sort of exuberance of the cast. Mm. You had a bunch of nobodies mm. who had had no real filmography before them. You know, Mark Hamill had been on General Hospital. And, yeah. You know, uh, Harrison Ford had uh, was in Apocalypse Now for six seconds. Carrie Fisher in Shampoo and famous for being the daughter right. of... Um, yeah. You know, yeah. It's yeah. being famous people's uh, child. Sure. Um, so, but none of them really had anything going on. And then they, they just get into this movie, which is like, let's go to London and make this weird uh, science fiction picture with this really odd standoffish director uh hostile crew and and say a bunch of stuff that makes absolutely no sense and uh, hope for the best uh, my my favorite I, my, i've got two two favorite scenes from from a new hope and they're both dialogue scenes mm-hmm. and you think dialogue in a star wars movie is, yeah you, you can't be good but no the the scene where um they just get to the death star and luke's trying to convince han to go rescue leia and the the sort of back and forth between them was was great the timing was good oh the she's it, rich thing you, yeah yeah, I mean, that, yeah 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 the, the the exact uh uh exchange was uh but they're gonna kill her better her than me oh uh, yeah <laughs> i just i love that and then later after they after they rescue her and they're on the falcon they're heading to to yavin uh han says um i don't know what do you think a princess and a guy like and he barely gets to start saying me when mm. luke cuts him off just no is it a moment of genius, or um, honest, has somebody I intervened? I, I mean, I've I've over the years I've read all the the drafts of of the first Star Wars movie, and uh, you know from the one that was just the hidden fortress with with with, with space guns to the one that more closely resembles the the eventual movie, and um, the dialogue is there mm. in in the fifth draft. That dialogue is there. Yeah. And I think it was just a matter of the people saying it like that may it pulled it off. I mean, this is probably just a coincidence, but you, know, you got a bunch of nobodies managed to make a great picture, and then you got a bunch of somebodies and made a, a pile of shit. Alec Guinness in, in Star Wars just seems to be like, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. Well, if you read his biography, which I have, he hates every minute of it. I mean, he considered it to be along the lines of, a, you know, in the 1970s, Amicus made a few terrible films like uh, The Land That Time Forgot, The People That mm-hmm. Time Forgot. He figured it was one of those. It wasn't going to hallmark his career or be anything mm-hmm. he was remembered for. Same as Richard Burton did a load of bad films. And, yeah. uh, you know, you... Uh, yeah, indeed. And um, you read his biography of, of just being increasingly haunted by this to his death. Yeah, but, he, uh, he was really he was rude to Star Wars fans. Oh, he, he was. To sign any any autographs for anybody younger than like eighty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's the thing that most annoys you about Star Wars in general? George Lucas. <laughs> the um, common thread. Yeah, the the common thread is is this guy who can't write and 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 can't direct, and has absolutely nobody around him who will say, you know what, maybe uh, having Jar Jar talk like that isn't a good idea. I want to take Rick McCallum out and and just break his legs because it's like, dude, you're the person who's supposed to tell the director, hey, you know what, not a good idea. Why why don't we do it? Why don't we do this instead of this? It's it's an executive producer. Actually, and I think he's the, he's not the executive. He's, he's just the producer. He's the guy who's who's supposed to be watching the movie and and going, wait a minute, why don't we try this? Why why don't we do this? And you know, it's it's been said that any movie can be saved if you have a competent DP and a competent editor. Mm. But the editor can't do anything if the footage that he has is crap. So it all comes back to having a DP who refused to say no to George Lucas's horrible ideas for mm. shots and George Lucas himself, who had the horrible ideas for the shots. And yet you love these movies. Uh, I'll watch the prequels. <laughs> I'll watch the prequels in Spanish uh, in as high a, a definition as I can as I can get my hands on, because even though the live action elements are really flat, the uh, the CG, especially the the vistas of of Coruscant and and Tatooine, just look 
fantastic. And I think that the people who are sitting in, behind keyboards making that are the people who made the only things worth watching in those movies. That and the 20 seconds where uh, Obi-Wan fights Darth Maul one-on-one. I, I have no use for episode two at all. And episode three, I I think episode three is, is mostly crap. I like to pretend that, that Darth Vader's lightsaber was red. Like basically af- after Palpatine starts calling Anakin Vader... I was re- I was really let down when he when he <laughs> when he's got his lightsaber and he's going to kill all those kids and he turns on still blue. I was like, oh. And true. then he goes and then he goes and he kills all the separatists and it's still blue. And then he fights Obi Wan and it's still blue. And I'm like, oh come on, man. In the wide shots, I can't even tell who the hell I'm supposed to be rooting for because both of their lightsabers are blue and they're they're these ridiculous specks well, on the screen. There are only two of them, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know they're fighting. <laughs> Yeah, Christensen himself. I mean, you see shattered glass, and you see uh, an uh, an actor of reasonable ability. What is the explanation for his appalling performance in n- nearly every shot he's in in bad, the prequels? Bad script, bad directing. I mean, it starts with a bad script, and then mm. and then continues with bad directing. It's the you know, Lucas is basically like stand here, say this, walk over here, say this, turn around, say this. Uh, and then walk over here and say this. You had you had characters in in A New Hope. You had I mean, granted they were broad, they were archetypes, but they they had sort of specific characters that you could latch onto and and identify and identify with, as opposed to Phantom Menace, where who the hell are these people? What am I supposed to care about? If you do not care, you have no character. Do you think you're done with Star Wars now? Are you going to follow the TV, uh, the TV show, and the further spin-offs? Well, I don't think that live-action TV show is ever going to happen. Mm-hmm. If it does, I will give it a shot because I can't help myself. I have a giant Star Wars tattoo. Yeah, yeah. what's it of? Do you, are you familiar with the with the comic artist Adam Hughes? I'm afraid I'm not. Yeah, uh, Google it. Um, it'll you know you'll yeah. you'll come up with all kinds of Star Wars art and all kinds of like uh, DC art also. Mm-hmm. Adam Hughes did a sketch at a con for somebody years ago, and uh, it's a sketch of Isla Secura, uh, the, the the blue Twi'lek Jedi from from Episode Two and and Three in a pinup pose, and she's naked, and one of her leku is covering her nipples, and she is holding her lightsaber in a suggestive way. And I have that, uh, and it's <laughs> surrounded by, uh, by a border, and the border, if when I turn my arm, you see that it's a thought bubble going down, and Yoda is sleeping in his chair on the inside of my arm. They're in photos, or it didn't happen. All right, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you the original sketch, and then I'll send you pictures of the tattoo itself. Okay, we'll hold you to that. But I, you know, I'm I'm tied to Star Wars in a way that I can't get out of. And the thing is, is that I got this tattoo even after the disappointments of of the prequels. Mm-hmm. Uh, even after Episode Three came out, and I was just like, wow, this is ludicrous. Uh, I still got this tattoo because Star Wars is such a huge, huge part of my childhood. My pre-adolescence my adolescence my post-adolescence and into my adulthood i still watch these movies and i i refuse to give george lucas any more of my money is is the issue i i don't i don't uh, want to it's it's like you've it's already like committed re- sorry aaron but you've already uh, committed to give me more, more but it's like money. reinforcing bad behavior you know it's i told i tell people don't buy francis coppola's wine because mm. that just you know, gives him the money to make his shitty movies, mm-hmm. and gives him the money to give to his daughter to make her shitty movies. Mm-hmm. Do not reward bad behavior. And yeah, I said I'll, I'll go see Empire when it comes back out. But that's just because it's Empire, and I'm a sucker. So yeah, generally speaking, I don't want to give him any more of my money. I I've read so many uh, expanded universe novels that it's nauseating. The current series of expanded universe novels I've only read one and a half of, and I decided I'm just going to wait till it's done because I hate getting into things in the middle. Yeah. They, they did, they did a big, and it's, this really started with, they did the, the new Jedi order, which was this huge, huge, huge 20 book series. I got it. I started reading it. I had absolutely no idea. It was 20 books long. 
there were five <laughs> books when I got into it. Yeah. And when I read, when I finished the fifth book and it wasn't over, I said, oh, holy shit, what did I do? And I jumped online and saw there were another 15 books that were going to take another four years to come out. And I, I screamed. I was just like, oh, god damn it, because it was really interesting. Mm. And it, I like what they continue to do with the original characters. I like that Han and Leia and Luke are all getting old now and that, and that their kids are becoming grown-ups. And I want to see where this continues to go. I want to, I want to watch these characters get old and die. Uh, I liked reading Chewbacca dying. This feels like a continuous world to me. I couldn't give a rat's ass about prequel Expanded Universe. I couldn't give a rat's ass about Old Republic stuff. I don't care, and I don't want to give them any money. I've edited uh, your Glee reviews for uh, like a year or two now, and talking to you now, I would have to describe you as an um, optimistic masochist. Yeah. Is yeah. That kind of, does that kind of sum it up? Yeah, I want things to be good. I, I want them to be good so much, and, and I subject myself to them even though they're not. <laughs> I, 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 you know, you notice I've stopped writing about Glee because mm. I couldn't find a new way to say the same thing every week. Yeah, but have you stopped watching it? That's not the thing. at all. I I still watch it. Yeah, every week there's a new episode tonight. Um, I I want things to be good so bad uh, that I can't tear myself away from them, uh, even if they're not. <laughs> Once I start something, I I have to see it through. Hope springs eternal. Oh my god, and it's so painful. I waste so much of my life watching things that suck. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I can't help myself. Just to close it, have you heard anything about hand shooting first this time? You you want to close on this? Yeah. Oh, well, or, or, or continue on it because I've I've not actually read anything uh, myself about it. Has there been a decision? Lucas <clears throat> said, mm. I I've I've gleaned this because I refuse to read the articles because <laughs> they would piss me off. Uh, Lu- Lucas has said that. His intention was always for Greedo to have shot first. I'm not making this up. Mm-hmm. Greedo was always supposed to have shot first. And of course, everybody has their old scripts and they go back and they <laughs> read the shit out of him and go, no, no. At no point was Greedo ever supposed to have shot first. And... It, it, and there was the, nobody ever filmed Greedo shooting first. This was he, Lucas is completely living in his own little bubble where whatever he says is true, and and we just have to accept it. When the truth is that everybody can just go look it up. He's still living in 1977, where where it's impossible to, to ver not impossible, but it's extraordinarily hard to to verify. It. Uh, a statement for your average, you know, your average film goer and your average you know, magazine reader. Well, think think of 1977 and heroes like um, Gene Hackman in The French Connection and um, Clint Eastwood in the Dirty Harry films. I mean, these were guys that would shoot first, and it, it was okay. Think mm-hmm. of Close Encounters. Um, the divorce thing came out in the end. It, it was removed from, from the movie, but at the time. Spielberg was going through a divorce or, you know, in the, in some stage of it, and it had a significance mm-hmm. to him, to it. By 1981, presumably, you know, he was past that and uh, moving on, he, and it didn't have the same resonance. So in terms of these films being a diary of what's going on with the filmmakers, I think some of these revisions may be because they don't have the emotional re- resonance anymore like Greedo being shot first that's great for the Dirty Harry era that's great for the mm-hmm. uh, French Connection era for this era you know Lucas looks at the um, hero archetype and says well you know that's not quite right unacceptable and I, I, I suppose that's his rationalization I mean that's all I it, think it is the problem I mean there's many problems but one of the problems is that it it denigrates the character arc of Han Solo where he starts as this person who will just shoot this poor bastard mm. who's you know who's just trying to get the money that is owed which by the way is 125,000 credits oh, um, <laughs> uh, he's, he's trying to get this money for his employer because it's owed to him and 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 this this scumbag just shoots him you know through a table uh, and and he drops dead and then he callously walks over to the bartender says you know sorry about the mess and flips him some coins and walks out and that is one totally badass 
And two, it gives you a starting point for the character to become a better person. If you've got him shooting in self-defense, yes. you, you don't have this arc there. All you have is, is the, the kid-friendly arc of him falling in love with Leia. I don't... I think that film, in many cases, in any cases that are possible, should be a personal statement for whoever's making them. So it's okay that Lucas wants to go and continuously uh, dick around with with the Star Wars movies. That's fine. Mm. The problem is that he wants to ignore that the version that we all fell in love with that made him an extraordinarily rich idiot... uh, (laughs) He, he wants to pretend it doesn't even exist. And I think that is wrong because he's the person who sat in front of Congress and said, Ted Turner should not be allowed to colorize movies because that destroys the movie itself. It destroys what the movie was. But, I mean, think of an example like, for instance, uh, a very important film for the history of Star Wars, The Dam Busters. Mm-hmm. Now, the, um, the dog in the original movie is called The N-Word. Um, right. So what are you going to do about it? I mean, that's what the dog was called. Uh, exactly. Of course, of course, in the network version, he's redubbed as Nero. But you know what you lose? You lose some sense, and it's not a nice thing, about how the British were in you know the 1930s and the 1940s, before we, we were a multicultural society. But then I've right. got to balance that off against uh, an Afro-Caribbean family watching that film in the afternoon now and having to put up with that word. Right. You know, it's a very thorny issue. I... I... I don't disagree with the idea of of censoring for broadcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's fine. But I think that any sort of permanent version of the film, one that you're paying for out of your own pocket to own, I think it should be the original version of the movie. I think it should be whatever that original version was. And if it's, and if, you know, the dog has an unfortunate name, that's just the way it is. There are a lot of unfortunate movies uh, since the dawn of film. Nobody's going back and removing all of the offensive stuff in Birth of a Nation. But what I'm saying is that uh, you get a, a nicer vision, uh, a nicer historical vision of Britain in the Bowdlerized version than you do in the original. Offensive Thank you for using is. that word. <laughs> <laughs> offensive as the word is, and you know, I'm not arguing that you know it should stay in the movie and not be redubbed to Nero. Offensive as the word is, it gives you a picture of Britain before the following 50 years. And if you keep doing that, if you keep recontextualizing a modern movie to suit the modern audience, then it begins to have no historical value. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not telling you anything about how things were. I don't have an answer for this, but um, for instance, in the last, oh, sometime in the last 12 months, I remember reading Huckleberry Finn and being absolutely shocked. And yet, uh, (laughs) yet this Mark Twain was... As far as I know, the only major writer writing uh, a young African American character, mm. and no one else would even bother to put that amount of effort into characterization. And yet, it's a shocking book to read in its original form. And now, here in Britain, it's being it's being re- redone for schools, and I can totally understand why. But suddenly, you begin to in the Bowdlerized version of um, Huckleberry Finn you're not getting a picture of uh, the actual context of the time. So you, you, it's a little bit like um, the Ministry of Information in 1984, you know, where they was, rewrite the newspapers. About, yeah, I was just um, I, 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 we, should do, I, we should do another podcast. About we should do another podcast. And I'm just saying there's no answer to it. Um, there's, there's, there's no easy answer. But um, in terms of redoing movies and adding things that are popular now to movies that were made Mm -hmm. 30 years ago. It's a consideration. Updating things isn't just to add 3D, it's to add modern appeal, appeal which wasn't needed back when the films were made. Right. You know? So, I don't know. I don't know. You're right. That's another podcast. To change something for, for immediate broadcast, and once the broadcast is over, it's done, fine. But... To, to permanently change a film is it's, it's, it's pointless and you're right it, it, it recontextualizes in a way that that robs a film of its original purpose and point mm. if a film in fact had an original purpose and point because there's hundreds of films that come out every year that don't that's our first podcast then Aaron um, thanks a lot <laughs> no problem at all uh, I will be here for as many as is humanly possible <laughs>